So let's move on and learn the reading strategy. <clears throat> so this is the reading comprehension. So a lot of times I will talk to um, students about reading and they'll say, I can read and I'm a good reader. And that they are, they can, they can articulate the words, they can sound them out. And then I say, but do you ever notice that you read something and you don't remember what you read? And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, you read it. You don't know what you read, and you have to read it again. You don't know what you read, and you have to read it again. And they say, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. How many of you do that, by the way? Yeah, it's a universal experience, just about. You probably don't do it in all subjects, but for those technical dry subjects and, and textbook type of stuff, you probably do do that, unless it's something that you have a lot of experience in. So the reading comprehension strategy goes like this. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Um, let's suppose that you go to the bookstore or the library and you're looking for something to read. So this is what the typical person does when they do this. They, they look up and they pull the book off the shelf and they read the title of it. Then they turn it over. They see if there's anything in the back to read and they read that. And then they kind of thumb through it and they'll stop, get a picture or something, thumb through it, maybe they'll read a little bit more. Then they may go over to the table of contents and kind of go down through it. Then they go like this. And they do, they do this wonderful thing to go, hmm. <laughs> no, they do. Now, what is that all about? What are, what are they doing when they do that? A ritual. A ritual, sometimes it may be. And they're also. What is it about? Right. They're, they're wanting to know. Wanting to know two things. What is this book about? And would it be of interest to me or of use to me or whatever other criteria I have that I read it? If it's novel, would I find it interesting? Would it usually be what they're going through. When you start to read something, if you will get an answer to that question right off the bat, what is this about and how am I going to use it? How will it be of interest to me? How is it important to me? Any questions like that that, that hits and elicits criteria? What that does is set up the frame for giving it meaning, and it allows you to become interested in it right from word go, and it gives you focus. Because sometimes you guys will start reading, and your mind drifts off, right? It goes off, and, and then you try to bring it back, and then it drifts off again. That's usually because you don't know what it is you're reading about, and you haven't connected what you're reading it for. Okay? So rather than waiting and going down and reading and letting that kind of bubble up and after a while you go, oh, this is what this is about. Get an answer to that question right off the bat and the way you do that is what you do when you pick up a library book. You look at the, the meaning, you look at the title of it and go, this is open water diver manual and there's a scuba diver on there. So, oh, this is about scuba diving, cool. Do I want to learn scuba diving? No. <laughs> Colorado, we don't do that much. so. Uh, th so do I want to learn scuba diving or not? If the answer is yes, then I go, oh, well, sure, I see what I'm going to learn this for. I see what I'm going to learn it, uh, the reason that I'm learning it, right? And you may want to, you may want to if, if it's not obvious to you, you may want to look in, in the, the book or the chapter of a book and just kind of look at the pictures, read the captions, because you're just trying to get a sense. You're not trying to get details. You're trying to get a sense of what this is about and how it will be of interest to you. Okay, so the first strategy is what I call setting, setting it up in your mind. You get an answer to the question, what is this about, and how is it important to me? Not will it be, how is it? How can I make it important to me? If you're a student and having to read something that you may not automatically be interested in. 
So I think anything can be made interesting. So it's not, oh, this is a history book. I don't like history. This is a history book, and oh, this is about history. And how can I, how can I do something that would make this important to me or make this interesting to me? OK? It automatically attaches to criteria, and it sets your focus, and it gives you the big picture. Now you're going to fill in the details. As far as textbooks are concerned, whenever you're trying to read something that's more complex, Lane, one of the ways the brain handles complexity is that it's the chunking down process. You start off with a big picture, and then you ch chunk down in the details, 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 and you do it in an organized fashion. So for example, you have this painting up here. Tell me what that painting is about. What is the painting of? Flower garden. Flower garden with some water in it, right? What are the basic elements that you see there? There's water, flowers. That's about it, right? All right? Do what? I think a butterfly. There's some butter. I don't know what that is. Let's, let's, take the, let's take the flowers. What's the breakdown of the flowers? So different color, different colors, different shapes, probably different textures if we were there feeling of them. What's the breakdown of the water? You have a pool and you have moving water, right? That's what I mean by breaking something down. So this is not necessarily important in a novel, but when you're reading something that's more complex, it's important for you to know how did the author break it down. Because that's how the author arranged the logic or arranged the story. So the second step is an answer to the question, how is it broken down? And if we were doing that picture right there, it would look like, I want it to look like this in your mind. You would say, a garden scene, and it has water, and it has flowers, and this has color, this has shape, this probably has texture, this has a pool of water, and it has moving water. You got it broken down in your, in your mind yeah, organized in your mind, however you want to think about that. And then the next thing is, what I want you to do is to read it visually. What that means is that you take the words, and as you sound the words out to yourself, you overlap them into pictures around the meaning of the words. Now, most of you have an experience of reading visually when you read novels and things like that that interest you. So what I will do with the kids that I have is when I've given them the Sports Illustrated and they've read it visually and I've identified that they read it visually, I'll say, you remember like you read Sports Illustrated? And I'll say, oh yeah, I had lots of pictures there. Okay, that's what we're going to do in this history book. They usually go, yuck. <laughs> Don't want to do that and want to make it more interesting if you can read it visually. It's going to be naturally important that they have a visual vocabulary or they won't be able to do this at all. Now in order for me to... Um, give them an experience of what I mean by reading visually, I do the horse story at this point. And I say, you know, listening visually is the same thing as reading visually. You just take the words in, either if you're sub-vocalizing or you're, you're saying it or somebody's saying something to you, and you just overlap it and make pictures. Let me give you an experience of what that's like. I'm going to tell you a story about a bunch of horses. So in your mind, I want you to put about eight to ten horses. You don't know what to do with them yet because I haven't told you what to do with them, but you have eight to ten horses in your mind. Now, we're going to start running the story. The horses are running. So if you'd had them just kind of standing around chomping on grass, now they've got to run. <laughs> okay? The horses are running very fast. So if they just had them trotting across the pasture, now they've got to get out. So you're adjusting the picture as more and more words come in. The horses are running very fast around the track. Whoops. You had them out in the middle of a pasture, now you've got to put them around a track. So if you don't have an idea of what a track looks like, you're going to have to construct one. Okay? Sometimes the kids will put them around a football track or a, you know, a track in school where they run track, you know, run round and round. 
Now some more. The horses are running very fast around the track in Remington Downs in Oklahoma City. Now for those of you that are in here that know what Remington Downs looks like, you can immediately go to a full life picture of what it looks like. Those of you that don't know what Remington Downs looks like, you're going to have to construct a picture of a horse racing facility and put the word Remington Downs on there. Okay? And that's one point that I will stop and give them a, a take a teaching moment. If, if it's somebody from Oklahoma City and maybe they've seen Remington Downs on TV or they've been there, their pictures will be real rich because they have some real life experience of what they're talking about. You have to say, okay, notice the difference in your pictures when I say this. The horses were running very fast around the track at Blue Ribbon Downs. And I say a racetrack that they don't know about. And I said, now what kind of, what's the difference in your pictures of Blue Ribbon Downs and of Remington Park? And they say, well, Remington Park is a lot better. You know, it's a lot more rich, so the colors are better. The others is kind of dull. I say, right. That's the difference when you're studying something that you have a lot of experiences of and when you're studying something that you don't have experiences of. You've got to create a visual vocabulary to give you more rich experience. And that's the reason we have the vocabulary strategy. All right? So then I'll go ahead and tell them the story. Let's finish the story. Uh, it was opening day, September the 1st, 1989. So how are you going to show it's opening day in your mind? And where are you going to put the date? A banner. Most people put a banner across the gate or something like this and put on the banner September the 1st, 1989. One kid was really creative. He said, I'm going to plane up in the sky with sky riding. It all works. Another one said, I want a guy selling newspapers outside the front gate. You can see it on the newspaper and he's selling Remington Park open September the 1st, 1989. That'll work too. Here we go with the story. The <clears throat> The, the, the skies were clear and the weather was balmy and the crowd was in a partying mood. The first race was on and the crowd was cheering wildly. <coughs> the winner of the first race was a horse by the name of Beetlebum. Where are you going to put the name of the horse? Because see, when you read textbooks, you got to insert that data in there so that you can remember those facts and figures. So where would you put the name Beetlebum of the horse? <coughs> Put it on the side of the horse. You could put it on the board that says the winner is. Any of those? The jockey that rode, rode Beetlebum to victory was named Sam Jones. Where are you going to put his name? Okay. And be sure you visualize this because we're talking about you know, doing it visually. After the race, the owners of the horse, Mr. and Mrs. Dale Wood of Colorado. Yeah, I'm going to go visit them. Mr. and Ms. Dale Wood of Colorado escorted the, the jockey and the horse to the winner's circuit, circle, where they were presented a trophy commemorating the first race at Remington Park. Now, so you've read this thing visually, so you like read one of these sections here, and you read it visually. Now, I'm wondering if you can guess what we do next. We go to the retrieval system, right? How do we construct a retrieval system? Well, just like you did with vocabulary and facts and figures, you bring up the pictures that you just constructed while you were reading, and you tell yourself what's in the pictures in your head. So one of the ways to shorten that down is that you review pictures with words and sounds. You tell yourself what's in it. So we do something like this. Well, this is about the opening day at Remington Park uh, in Oklahoma City, September the 1st, 1989, and the crowd, and there's the weather. But no, well, the first race was won by Beetlebum, and his jockey was Sam Jones, Mr. and Ms. Dale Wood of Colorado, and they gave a, a winner's circle to commemorate the first race. And you just tell yourself everything that's in it. Or you can make a story up to make any difference. And again, what this does is really important because it strengthens the picture, first of all, if you will instantly review it. It adds a retrieval system because you're now putting sounds with the pictures. And it also lets you know if there are any gaps there. Because if you went, wait, wait a minute, what was the name of that the jockey? 
And all of a sudden, you realize that when you na read the name of the jockey, you forgot to visualize it, which happens sometimes. <clears throat> so at that time, you go right back into the story, pick up only the stuff that you're having trouble remembering, and put it in your picture, and then tell yourself what's in the picture. <coughs> My goal is for you to read it one time and never have to read it again. Because then, guess what's going to be the next, last step? <laughs> Test. Now, you, pra you practice the review. You practice step four. Over time. Over time, right. <laughs> and all you have to practice is step four. And see, the nice thing about practicing what's in your mind is that you can do it while driving down the street. You can do it while going to the kitchen to get a glass of water. You can, because you don't have to have your books with you. You're just up here reviewing what you, what you, how many of you have ever gone to a movie? This is called. Oh, <laughs> this is, just in general. <laughs> just in general. Now, when you go to a movie, have you ever seen a movie that was so good that you were telling a buddy about it or something like this, and you just read, read did the track of the movie and told him everything? It's exactly what we want to happen here. And that every time you do that, uh, you can, you know, recall it vividly. I don't know how many of you play golf, but one thing about golfers is that they can go out and play a round of golf, and they can come back and tell you in great detail <laughs> what happened on every hole. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's just incredible, the, the memory that they have, because it's full body sensation. OK? Does this make sense? Yeah. And every step is important. I mean, it's really important that you set it up. It's really important if it's a complex material that you break it down. See, when you break it down like this, and with the stuff that Elaine was talking about, you just have more complexity. But when you get through, you have the whole uh, chapter you know, spread in your mind. Now, once you have all that data, information spread out in your mind visually, your mind can analyze, synthesize, what's the cause effects, and can do all that higher level stuff. But you've got to get the data in there before you can do that. And it's best if you get it in there in an organized fashion. That makes sense? Oh, yeah. It's sort of kind of like a mind map, really, isn't it? It is. I mean, you could, instead of having it like this, you yeah. could do it as a mind map. Right. Sure. It's more powerful than a mind map, though, because you've got actions. For some people, it is. Yeah. So, let me some few questions before I send you off to practice. Yes, Don? So I'm essentially going back to Elaine's question. Um, of course, there's a lot of students that I worked with this uh, winter were taking anatomy and physiology. There's incredible amounts of detailed information, terminology, pages and pages. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Anatomy and physiology, pages and pages of terminology, definition, right. and so in thinking about this strategy, it's reading it once, but it, it, it particularly as people haven't used these strategies before, it's going to be a very slow progress through each individual page to create the pictures, to uh, anchor that vocabulary, uh, all of the, the pieces that we've been describing. Um, and I'm just thinking about the student who's thinking, God, I've got 30 pages to read before class in two days, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working parents with very little time. Right. So, so it's a, a big piece in this is the, the, the shift of belief about how I study, how I use my time in studying what will be productive for time. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that little kid learning to walk. I mean, it's, it's it, the analogy is the same thing. And the, the thing that is the, the biggest downer about all of this is the fact that most students, you know, if you get a high school student that comes in or even a college student that comes in and sees me and I teach them this type of stuff, their visual vocabulary is way down to probably fifth or sixth grade. And they've got to catch up. And that's just, well, oh, man, I've got to do all that extra work. Well, you can think of it that way, or you, you know, you can think of it as I get to catch up, uh, and it, it is a difficult thing sometimes to get them to do it. 
So my two strategies for, for getting them to do it is like this. I say, to me, you probably have two ways that you can do it. If you have the time, you know, go get some um, graded vocabulary words. In other words, what are, what are the words that are typically learned at the sixth grade? What are the words that are typically learned at the seventh grade? And just go down through them. And when you see one that you don't know what it means, run the, run the vocabulary strategy on that. And just gradually build your vocabulary until you get to where you are. Another more simpler way to do it would be as you're starting to read and you hit a word that you don't know, then stop, have the dictionary or the glossary right there by you and, and learn it on the spot. What you will be doing then is learning only the words that you need to learn. And it'll be a little bit more efficient, a little bit more timely. But it will slow them down. But if they read it without knowing the vocabulary, they ain't going to get anything, you know. And, and sometimes I will say, well, yeah, let's go ahead and try this. I want you to have some experiences of doing it. And then think about when you're reading this stuff and you read it five times, how, how much time does that take if you read it five times? And most of them will look at me and say, I don't. You know, I just bug out and don't read it at all. So uh, it, and let, me, let me ask this, Don. Do, do you read novels? Do you like to read novels? Yeah. Are you aware if you visualize when you read novels or not? I, I think I do as we've been talking about it. I wasn't yeah. aware of it then. But. So what I will do is get them into something that they already visualize in when they read and say, well, how, how long does it take you to read that? And are you saying it takes me too long because you're so naturally into visualization? What we want to do is get you back in that natural strategy, build up your visual vocabulary so that you can do that and it becomes automatic. I, when I read, I don't stop to think, am I visualizing? It just happens naturally and that's the installation of the strategy that makes that happen. And it does get faster and faster. In fact, I have a little uh, exercise that I do with the kids that I work with called the zit story. And because what I want them to do is realize when they're not visualizing. So <clears throat> I will run them through this little exercise. I'm, I think I won't do it with you all, but it, it's, it, you can imagine that you're doing it. Um, I say, I'm going to give you a set of instructions. Okay, Sharon, let me do it with you. Just have somebody to look at. I'm going to give you a set of instructions. They'll be simple little instructions. She's not, she's not going to say anything. So just simple little instructions. And I want you to visualize yourself doing it. Okay, So it'll be things like I want you to stand up. And I want you to touch the top of your head with your right hand. Because the things like, don't do it yet. OK. So I, I'm going to give you probably about six instructions. I want you to sit there and visualize yourself doing it. Maybe even add some micro muscle movements. Like if I say, go over and knock on the door with your right hand, you might move your right hand just to kind of see what your right hand and remember in muscles that it's your right hand. OK? So here we go. In a minute, I'm going to want you to stand up. And I want you to turn to your right. And I want you to walk over to Perla. And I want you to extend your right hand and shake her hand. Then I want you to um, um, walk back over to Elisa. And with your left hand, I want you to tap her on the shoulder, pat her on the shoulder. Then I want you to go over to Sandy and say, did I do it right? And then you can go sit down. Got it all? Let's go ahead and let you do it. Did I do all right? Yes, you did. <laughs> now, I was hoping all of you were running through that in your mind's eye. We, I hope you were. At least you could. Now, again, in order when when. Um, when you're reading something, it's like if I was reading something in Arabic or I was reading something in German or I was reading something in any other subject, um, it wouldn't go through like that. I wouldn't be able to overlap and make pictures of, of what it is the word meant because I, I wouldn't know the word at all. But a lot of these kids that I work with don't know any foreign languages, and I don't know any foreign languages, so I, I resorted to what I called a zit story. I said, I'm going to give you another set of instructions. I'm going to give all of you a set of instructions. And when I hit a word that I don't want you to be able to visualize, I'm going to replace the word with zip. And I want you to feel what it's like to actually have a story come in in the English language and you not be able to visualize it. Okay, so here we go. 
Um, in a minute, I'm going to want you to stand up, and I want you to turn to your zit. And then with your zit hand, I want you to zit zit. Sounds obscene, doesn't it? <laughs> and then I want you to go over to zit and say zit zit. And then go, this will be easy for you, zit down. <laughs> now, how well did your pictures run? Yeah, there are no pictures there at all. And that's what you do when you're reading something and you don't have the visual vocabulary to go with it. And so you can't form and the pictures have holes in them and all sorts of things happen and we get frustrated. And it goes back to the vocabulary strategy. And then once we have the vocabulary, it goes back to doing something like this, being able to do it. So they, they go together very tightly. Now, just to make sure that you have a good experience about reading comprehension, I want you to do the following exercise. Uh, there's lots of reading material over here. There's some books, there's a stack of magazines, there's, um, uh, there's a couple of newspapers, there's um, some USA Today, there's a, a newspaper here in Oklahoma City called the Gazette that has all the happenings about what's going on in Oklahoma City. Pick anything of interest to you. I want you to get a partner first before you do that. And then both of you, and I'll spread some of that stuff out up here. Both of you go over there and get a, some reading material that you would be most interested in. So if you pick up a Life magazine or a Time magazine or newspaper, find a story in there to read. And then <clears throat> each of you have a story that you are reading. And then after you've read it and the other person has read there's a short story. This is not, we don't have time for a long one. Or if you get, if you get a book, just read a section of it. And make sure that you go through each of the steps. What is this about and how is it important to me? How is it broken down? And if you read something like in a newspaper, you may not, may not be able to, to do this one because it probably won't be broken down. Then read it visually. Be sure that you insert all the information in it and then review it in your mind's eye. After you've done that, then I want you to swap stories and I want you to do it all over again with each other. Then what I want you to do, and you can do it either way, test the other person, you ask them questions about one story, and then when you've asked them questions about one of the stories, and you've answered them, or they've answered them, then they turn around and they ask you questions about the other story. And just notice how well you can visualize and how well you can put that information in your mind. It would be best if you could find something to read that has some data in it, that looks more like a textbook or something like that. But we don't have a lot of textbooks that of various um, levels, so that's your choice, is to pick something out of that stack over there. Any questions about the exercise? Yes? Should we read it uh, out loud first, or we read it to ourselves? I, I don't have that clear in my mind. Read it to yourselves, because you're both going to be sitting there reading at the same time. And then you're going to do the review and practice, and then you're going to swap the, the story. So that you both have read two articles and know everything there is to know in both articles, or both That's two. Hard. You're tired? That's hard to read two and remember both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. This hour. How much time? Um, you get, um, I'll give you 20 minutes. See, my cameraman has learned to do this. <laughs> That's right. So that is the reading comprehension strategy, and I'll be real interested in um, finding out <coughs> how it worked with you, for you. Good? Can you elaborate more, Ed? <laughs> well, basically, you had, to do an awful, you had to do an awful lot more visualization, because as I was reading certain areas about the exploration of space and the mountains, I can see people climbing up the mountains. Mm -hmm. I can see uh, the exploration of space. <laughs> I can see the exploration of space. You can see the spacecraft taking off. And then it also spoke uh, the article that I was reading about uh, Cousteau. And since I dived, I could just visualize myself under the water mm -hmm. looking at all the pretty little dishes. Sure. So it came, a, came alive for you. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the whole point. 
<laughs> is to make it come alive for you. So anytime you get it into subjective experience, then that's, that's, that's part of the, the nature of how to make something come alive for you. If you just keep it in words, then words are so disassociated. Words are nothing more than labels connected to experience. So if you don't go from the labels to the experience, then you don't really have anything. I mean, that, that to me is, is the whole point. So thank you for that summary. Yes? Especially how to add the, um, the right facts into the story, like unlabels, unsigns, embroidered in, dates, names, these kind of things. This was something new that I was adding mm -hmm. into my visualization so did, of the story. Did it work? Yes, very much. Good. Great. Um, the story that I picked had lots and lots of pictures in it. And I found oh, you it cheated. Really, really, no, I found it very difficult to make my own pictures and put the facts into it because there was something already present. And I thought that was really a surprise to me, and it was mm -hmm. very interesting. If you notice when you, um, when you read a science book, um, and sometimes a history book, but it's more, it's norm, more normally in a science book. They'll have um, a narration, and they'll have a lot of photographs or pictures or graphs or drawings or things like this. And the, the words are nothing more than descriptions of the pictures. And yet what we do is go through there and read the words and don't just focus on what, the, what are the, the things that they're offering in, in, in the science book that can help our visual memory. It's... Um, I, well, I have, let me tell one more story, Janet, before. Um, I had a young woman, she was about an 11th grader in school, and she was taking zoology. And um, <clears throat> she was a very bright young lady, but she, her mother was a, trying to get her into Harvard, and so she was, she was very good, but she wasn't, according to her mother, good enough to make it into Harvard. And so um, she came to me, and, and she, she did all the stuff that we've been talking about doing. And so I said, well, bring me an example of something that you want to learn in zoology. So she brought me this, I think, about a two-page narrative about how the digest, no, how the um, uh, digestive system worked. And she was going through there trying to memorize everything that happened. You know, that when you, when you ate a bite of food or something like this, it went down the esophagus, and then the, you know, the pancreas just stuck this stuff in, and your gallbladder did this, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Visualize it. I mean, that would make a perfect motion, a, a motion picture. You know, just watch yourself or watch the person that you're doing. Take a bite of the of whatever it is and then just watch it go down. And when the enzymes come in or whatever comes in from the pancreas, label them. You know, put the label in your picture. And um, she, she was so, she was, she was that kind of person that we were talking about before that says, don't you dare take my written material away from me. And yet she could visualize very, very well. But she was so ingrained in the auditory track that it was very difficult for her to turn loose of that. Jeanette. Well, I was probably another one that kind of cheated, and I picked out an article that was had a lot of descriptive writing in it. So there was a lot of imagery pretty much all the way through it. But I found was that was interesting to me because I didn't realize I did this when I read that kind of writing. What became very important to me was that I made kind of a map of the organization of the article. And mm -hmm. that was actually what helped me recall most of it was knowing, knowing my map of the article. Exactly. That's what that's for. Because when, you, when you're reading something like that, you, can, you, you start off at the beginning and say, okay, this article is about. Well, that's it gets your mind in gear, and it was broken down like this, and it was broken down like this, and what I remember about this one section right here was, and then what I remember about this section was. And, I mean, that's one of the values of being able to, to do that breaking down, is that it does organize it in a way that helps you to remember. It's not just random stuff that's floating around in your brain. I, unlike the last two, took something that was very difficult for me, <laughs> which was the insects of North America. And it was very, <laughs> very interesting because I had to make my own pictures. And like when it would say two, 230 million years ago, I remember that. Yeah. And the, uh, the dragonflies uh, was the one that I picked. They had a wingspan of over two weeks. Oh, over two feet. I mean, that I could remember that, but wow, 
but it was like being able to make my picture. It did take longer to read it and to basically expand on that little dragonfly. But yeah, I can I can recall, which is amazing for me because mm -hmm. it used to be all all memorization. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have to study that over and over just to get the. Yeah. So when you say it took you a long time, it would take you a long time if you did it over and over and over again, too. Oh, oh much longer. And which one is most interesting? This was much more fun. Yeah. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir? I really got emphasized how, how important it is that you find, that you find this of importance for you. said, sir, any of this article about American football, and it's a sit article. <laughs> What do I, what, I don't even know what a quarterback is, touchdown, and what does it mean to be moved from safety to cornerback? How can I make a picture of that? I have no idea. So now you, so now you have a good experience of this real zit story, yeah. And he looks at me and says, it's <laughs> Yeah. And you all know from, you know, most of you know <clears throat> Some of us do, anyway. <laughs> Terminology. You'd have to go to terminology, go to the... Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's, let's pause for the day and let Nathan uh, shut everything down. I have one more tiny little thing I want to do for your handout, actually, and then uh, tell you a little bit about tomorrow, and then I want you to get in your small groups and go, what did I learn today? Now, let me, let me make a suggestion of what I think sometimes is going on in those small groups in the morning and in the evening. Uh, this is not the time for question and answer. This is not the time to reteach something or relearn something. This is the time in the morning to go, what is my intention for the day? In the evening, what did I learn today? Uh, sometime during this week, the, the small groups are going to get together for an extended session, like over lunch or something like this. That's when I want you to use that time to you know what's going on and 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 all the all that deeper stuff like this uh, or you can do it this way you can do the small group with the intention and then what did I learn today and then dismiss everybody and then if somebody has a question if the coach wants to stand around or hang around and answer the question that's okay but I'd like to keep that meeting kind of pure as to what its intention is if you will I have a, a handout that was supposed to be in your um, in your manual on the assessment, but mysteriously did not end up in there. And I'd like you to, if you want to, you can take it home tonight and uh, look over it because in the morning, in fact, let me start handing it out now. <clears throat> in the morning, uh, 10 o'clock, I will go over the assessment in the morning, by the way, uh, the assessment process. And then at 10 o'clock, we have the insurance agent that I told you about coming in and you'll get to watch me hopefully do what's on that that's assessment. This is what I've been wanting Well, you're going to stick around, aren't you? I am. <laughs> okay. You can't kick me out. All right. Um, rest well. Take care of yourself. Um, have a good night. And I'll see you at 9 o'clock in the morning sharp. <laughs>